Chapter 13, Living Pictures. Nancy saw the heavy volume falling and jumped aside. The big book crashed to the floor inches from her feet. The violent shaking of the earth ceased abruptly. Mr. Basswood had rushed from his office and into the street. Nancy, too, hurried toward the doorway. She could see people running and hear shouts of, What happened? Was it an earthquake? Noticing that Mr. Basswood's office door was open, Nancy ran inside and turned on the radio to a local station. She was just in time to hear, We interrupt this broadcast to give you a report on the earth tremor in Waterford. It was not an earthquake. There was a gas main break underground with a resultant explosion. All danger is over, but everyone is asked to be sure gas burners are turned off. We will broadcast a further report as soon as it is received. The young detective made a quick survey of the office. Half buried under a pile of papers that had shifted on Mr. Basswood's desk was the volume he had removed from the bookshelf. Hearing Mr. Basswood's footsteps, Nancy tucked the volume under her arm and scooted back into the main room. Quickly, she hid the book behind some others and began picking up the volumes that had fallen to the floor. Mr. Basswood walked toward her, saying, This is terrible, terrible! What a loss! You're insured, of course, Nancy asked him. He did not reply, and Nancy could not decide whether it was because he did not want to or because he was not paying attention to her question. He went outdoors. All around the shop, paintings lay upside down on the floor, and nearly every art object in the place had fallen over. Nancy noticed a statuette that had slipped from a pedestal to the floor and cracked wide open. It was tagged as an original marble piece and highly priced. Nancy was amazed to see that it had an inner metal armature to support the arms and legs. The piece was not solid marble, but a reproduction made of white cement and marble dust. And not worth what Mr. Basswood was asking for it, she thought. On a hunch, Nancy picked up the base of the statue. She was not surprised to see M. Decay faintly carved into it. I must find out who that person is, Nancy said to herself as she began to pick up the scattered pieces. Half an hour later, Mr. Basswood came back. I'm going to close the shop for the day. There's too much of a mess in the place for customers to shop. You go on home, Miss Lindbrook. I'll send for you when I want you back. But I don't like to leave you with all the cleaning up to do, Nancy remarked. I'll stay and help. Instead of being grateful, the shop owner looked at his employee angrily. I said go, and I mean go. He pointed toward the door. Nancy shrugged. All right, if you say so. As she went to get her coat from the back room, Mr. Basswood returned to his office. In the rear room of the shop, Nancy found things topsy-turvy. To her amazement, a large high boy had slid out of place, revealing a hidden door. I wonder what's behind the door, Nancy thought, and how much damage has been done. She opened the door and gazed into a dim room with a small skylight. Nancy could vaguely see small pieces of statuary on the floor, sculpting tools which had apparently fallen from a workbench, and several large portrait frames. These stood along one wall on which hung an enormous canvas cloth. Miraculously, the frames had not toppled over. I must investigate this room further, Nancy thought. She closed the door, put on her coat, and walked toward the front entrance. Mr. Basswood was standing there. He held the door open, impatient for her to leave. Hurrying toward the shop were Bess and George. The cousins looked excited. You all right? they asked Nancy. And Bess added, Wasn't the quake a fright? The two girls stepped into the hallway of the shop. Oh, Mr. Basswood, you're to go to the hospital immediately, George told him. What? he exclaimed. Bess said the two girls had taken an injured woman to the hospital. The patients there were pretty frightened. We went up to see Mr. Atkin. He kept saying he had to talk to you at once, and that somebody must go get you immediately. A look of alarm came over Mr. Basswood's face. Then he regained his composure. You're sure of this? he asked. Both Bess and George nodded. Bess said, We told him we were coming over to your shop and would tell you. Mr. Basswood looked skeptical. Did he suspect some trick? He asked, 
If Atkin wanted me in such a hurry, why didn't he telephone? The nurse at the desk said she'd tried, but your phone didn't answer, George said. It didn't ring, the shop owner said. Did it, Miss Lindbrook? No. I'll go try it now and see if it's out of order. You stay out of my office, Mr. Basswood said firmly. Nancy was eager to do some real sleuthing. If she could get Mr. Basswood to go to the hospital and leave her there, she would have an opportunity to look around for clues. To her relief, Mr. Basswood turned, went back to his office, and closed the door. Quickly, Nancy whispered to the girls, Don't go! Hide someplace! George took the cue. In a loud voice, she said, Come on, Debbie, hurry! What say we go have some fun? Nancy grinned gratefully, then closed the front door with a bang. Quickly, she tiptoed to the rear room and slipped behind the high boy. Bess and George had already hidden themselves in the large room. Seconds later, they heard the shop owner lock his office door from the outside. He walked through the hall and let himself out the front door. When Bess and George felt sure he was not going to return, they hurried to the back room. What do you want us to do? George asked Nancy. Follow me and I'll show you. Bess grabbed the other two girls. This is awfully scary. Suppose we're caught. We'll have to take that chance, Nancy told her. I found a hidden room. There are lots of things in it. She opened the door and tried to find a light switch on the wall, but could not locate one. Figuring there might be a hanging light over the workbench, she started toward it. Shouldn't we shut the door? Bess queried. Yes, Nancy replied. By this time, the girl's eyes had become accustomed to the small amount of light which filtered through the dusty skylight. Bess and George were intrigued by the huge picture frames. They were old and covered with gold leaf. Nancy noticed a stack of books, tied up, that stood on the floor. I wonder if they're part of Mrs. Merriam's collection, she thought. I'll look. She walked over to the pile and her suspicions were confirmed. A card had been tucked under the cord. There was one word on it, Miriam. Before the girls had a chance to examine the books, they heard heavy footsteps outside the door. Nancy knew they were not Mr. Basswood's. Was there a burglar in the shop? And what should she do? Instantly, the young detective made a decision. Grabbing Bess and George by their arms, she pointed toward the empty portrait frames. Pose, Nancy whispered. The three girls stepped through the frames against the canvas. Each one kneeled and took a different pose. They assumed profile positions so they could not be identified easily if the intruder should happen to know them. This is fearful, Bess thought nervously, but she held very still. George and Nancy held rigid poses. The door opened and a muscular man clomped into the room. Nancy almost forgot to hold her pose. He was the man who had forced his way into the Drew house by the front door and attacked her father. I must capture him, she told herself, but wondered how to do so. The man began looking around and mumbling to himself. At first the girls could not distinguish any words, but presently he talked louder. The money's got to be here somewhere, he said. He owes it to Marco and me. We got a right to take it. In his search, the newcomer suddenly lurched into Bess's frame. It fell over, striking Bess, who also went down. Instantly, the intruder realized that the person in the frame was alive. Oh, cried Bess. The man gave a deep grunt, then yanked Bess up from the floor. At the same instant, Nancy and George leaped from their frames. End of chapter 13